Local broadcast of Arkansas Week is made possible in part by the award-winning Arkansas Democrat Gazette, Arkansas's largest major newspaper, bringing you local, national, and international news since 1819. By the Arkansas Times, keeping you informed by covering people, events, and politics in Arkansas. By FM 89, KUAR in Little Rock, with in-depth news reporting, analysis, and discussion each weekday. Hello again, everyone. Thanks for joining us and welcome to a special edition of Arkansas Week. The constant viewer knows that in odd numbered years, we use a part of the August recess to take time to sit down with our United States representatives. And our guest is the Honorable Steve Womack, who sits for the third district of Arkansas. Congressman, welcome back. Thanks Steve, for Steve, always with us. great to be with you and to be here on AETN. You, uh, you've had a tumultuous uh, first six months, seven, in, uh, of this session of Congress. And the governing party, has very, which you have acknowledged, has very little to show for it. What are your constituents saying? Well, what are they telling you? You know, it depends on the, the subject. But the general uh, consensus is that, um, you know, the question is, why haven't you gotten more things done? And, uh, and I get that a lot. And, and not just in the first six months or first seven months of this year of the new administration, but going back the last seven years, if you will, uh, s similarly, you know, we've been on continuing resolutions and occasionally an omnibus package and those kinds of things. And we've talked about government shutdowns and even shut the government down in 2013. And so there's been this general feeling that Congress is dysfunctional. And I don't think that has changed necessarily in the first seven months, primarily because there were a lot of promises made in the campaign, as there always are. And um, among those was a uh, repeal and replacement of the Affordable Care Act and tax reform. Well, Affordable Care Act was the and, top of the and, list of a lot of your Sure, and, yeah. and then immigration was a major talking point during the last election. And if you look at those big three, uh, nothing has happened just yet. In other words, nothing has gotten to the finish line, that being the desk of the president where he could sign it. That doesn't mean that um, parts of the legislative process haven't worked, uh, because parts of it have worked. And I can only speak from the House perspective. We've been very active. We've gotten a lot of things finished. I'm proud to say here in the middle part of August that before we broke for the recess, the Budget Committee marked up and passed in committee its budget resolution for 2018. That, that's a major accomplishment. It hasn't been passed in the House yet, but it's passed out of committee. And the House Appropriations Committee has indeed marked up all 12 of its appropriation bills for 2018. We have sent four of those in a package, a security package to the Senate, that being DOD, Energy and Water, which houses our nuclear programs, Ledge Branch, and the Military Construction Veterans Administration bills. We package those four. Those are now at the Senate. The other eight bills of the 12 are ready for House action when we come back after September 1st. So we've done some things. Steve, you know, Ways and Means has been working hard on tax reform, but the, one of the components of tax reform one of the one of the key pillars of it was a border adjustment tax, a tax on imports, if you will, that the leadership has finally said, well, we recognize that that's dead on arrival, so we're going to scrap it and kind of move in a different direction. So we haven't been able to accomplish tax reform. We did put a billion six for the wall for, for on the immigration side of the debate. Um, in our funding package, so at least we're moving toward the promise of the president to uh, strengthen border security. So it's not that we haven't had parts of the legislative process, uh, all of it fail, some of it's working. Just have a little problem on the other side of the Capitol with the 
the necessary votes in the Senate and, and the inability of the Senate to move some of this to the finish line. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to defend what we've done in the House. It's just that we haven't got a lot to show for our work from enacted law. Well, your colleagues on the other side of the Capitol would say, well, that you've touched on the problem. <clears throat> You're sending us legislation that you know we can't accept, some, including in it the does, Republican yeah. majority. For instance, the Affordable Care Act, you joined the, <clears throat> the conference, GOP conference in the House in its entirety in sending the repeal and replace over. And it you used the term dead on arrival. It was term dead on arrival, too. Maybe not on arrival, but it, it was by a couple of weeks ago anyway. Uh, you know, that, that's, a, that's a fair uh, statement. Uh, it took us seven or eight weeks to go from what our original idea was to something that could muster 217 votes, just a very skinny passage that day. I remember it well. And if you remember what happened in, in those seven or eight weeks, Steve, the bill did not have enough support in the House for various reasons. It wasn't just right. If it went too far to the right, you lost the moderate wing. If it went too far to the left, you lost the, 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 the House Freedom Caucus wing, the, the right part of the party. And the Speaker of the House was trying to negotiate um, this issue because we felt like that with the, and, and I don't want to get too weedy here, but we were doing this under the 2017 budget reconciliation procedure, which would allow us to deliver something from the House to the Senate where the Senate would not be subject to a filibuster. Right. So the Speaker knew it's do or die with us. We got to produce something to give to the Senate so we can keep the ball in the air and find some reasonable way to keep the, gen the, the conversation going. We knew the Senate would take our bill and look at it from the bottom up or top down and send something back to us that maybe we could go to conference on and come up with a workable solution. So I'll be the first guy to tell you that what, what I voted for, what I supported, and what we sent to the Senate was not, an, was not the most ideal pieces of legislation, but I couldn't, uh, for the life of me, s vote against something that would serve a purpose to keeping the ball in the air over in the Senate and give us an opportunity to go to conference and let a bicameral uh, process unfold. If we hadn't have voted for that in, in June, I'm afraid the health care debate would have ended in the House, and then the House would have been the reason we don't have health care reform today. So some of what you say is true, and I agree with it, but there's always, um, there's always another side that, uh, that need uh, another set of considerations that need to be understood, and, and that's part of it. Is the ball still in the air? Oh, uh, well, that's, uh, that's, a, that's a $64 question. When John McCain said no, you think the ball dropped, uh, as they say now, the microphone dropped, and, and the, the game was over. I have been hopeful that uh, the week after we broke for the August recess that the Senate stayed in session, they, they might have been able to resurrect it. Maybe there's still a chance it can be resurrected after Labor Day, but I'm not so sure. I'm going to defer that question to Mitch McConnell because it's in the hands of the Senate right now. Well, and, uh, who, <laughs> who your pre the, the president has even today, and by the way, to, for benefit of our audience, we're taping this broadcast on a Thursday before it's Friday night airing. Dawn had barely awoke, had barely broke on Thursday before Mr. Uh, Trump and his members of his team are firing heat-seeking missiles at Mr. McConnell. Thus far, I think by this time in the afternoon, he's ignored them. Surely that can't make the work any easier over there. Well, it doesn't. It doesn't. And uh, we, we uh, you know, I'm not, I'm not going to get too far into the discussion about the style of the president. Uh, we all do, we, we'd all do things probably a little bit differently. Uh, but at the end of the day, uh, Mitch has got a difficult job in the Senate. That's why reconciliation was so important, Steve. We, there are 52 Republicans over there. Holding all 52 is hard on some things and proved uh, very difficult on this matter because you lost three. Um, and 
and if you can't hold those 52, then if you're back to regular order where you're having to do this through the normal legislative process, you're subject to a filibuster, then the number goes to 60. So the Senate rules are uh, somewhat problematic for getting things to the finish line. But I don't, I, I agree, I, I don't think it's healthy or productive uh, to have a lot of name calling, finger pointing, tweets and what have you uh, directed at the leaders who are doing their very best to corral their members. There's just a tremendous amount of uh, diversity uh, in both uh, parties in the Congress. Uh, and I can, I, I feel like a subject matter expert on the House side because I see it every day. I know there's a moderate wing, there's a group of people like me that are kind of caught there in that middle piece between the really ultra conservatives and the, and the more liberal piece of our base. But look, we have 241 people over there. Uh, and if you lose 25 or 30 of them on any substantive vote, then you don't have the votes to pass. So we got to figure out a way to bring these sides together and make them work. And I think that's what the American people want us to do. With uh, you know, the, the House version that, that was sent over to the Senate and even on the multiple Senate versions, including the final skinny repeal, skinny. that put you and your colleagues in the Arkansas delegation at odds with the governor of your own party or, uh, here in Arkansas. Obviously an awkward position. Let me, let me, let me phrase the question this way. Is it your view, and there seems to be some sentiment in your caucus, both House and Senate, that like it or not, better or worse, the AC Affordable Care Act, Obamacare, is now essentially institutionalized. Do you accept that? Uh, not necessarily. Uh, again, I'm uh, call me the eternal optimist, but I'm also I'm very optimistic that when we come back after Labor Day, having had several weeks at home listening to constituents, not me, but others, uh, that, that there will be an epiphany on the other side of the Capitol that, hey, we really need to do something because the Affordable Care Act in its present form is uh, not serving uh, the majority of Americans the way uh, it was promised to serve. Uh, deductibles have gone extremely high, making access to the health care coverage almost impossible for a lot of people unless they have a catastrophic condition. Uh, the premiums we all know are going higher. We're losing insurers and in a lot of uh, critical markets on the exchange. So the, 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 there's just so many components to it. And, and Steve, it's hard. Healthcare affects people different ways. It affects you differently than it affects me. So there are this, there's this wide range of opinion about health care, and that's why uh, finding the sweet spot on a legislative proposal uh, has proven so difficult. Uh, th this I do know, that if we don't do something to make major reforms uh, to the health care delivery system, uh, and insurance markets, and all, all the things wrapped up into health care as we know it today, if we don't do something, uh, then I think there's going to be a, 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 a lot of regret on the part of a lot of people that we didn't act when we, when we had the chance. Now, that's just on the substance. On the political side, I think there will be, uh, I think there will be some uh, consequence politically for not having achieved something that we said we would be able to deliver. So uh, I, th I think after Labor Day, we'll, uh, we'll see what, what the mood of the Senate is in that first uh, week to 10 days. Well, <clears throat> back to, to, to state versus congressional interest here. Uh, Mr. Hudson was just open. I can't live with this, as were a number of other Republican governors. The Medicaid expansion is saving the states millions of dollars and putting tens of, across the country, tens of millions of people back under insurance coverage. Why don't you, they seem to be saying, why don't you fix the exchanges by funding them better uh, and making some other changes rather than scrap much of the system as the bill was, was, uh, was going to do? What, would your, what were your conversations like with Mr. Hutchinson? Feel, well, no, free, yeah. to, feel, oh. feel free to violate his confidence. Oh, no, no. Uh, uh, nothing in confidence. Uh, the governor inherited uh, what he inherited. And uh, so the, the, the Medicaid 
population group was expanded in the state of Arkansas under the Arkansas Works Program. And so as governor, he's got to figure out a way, given the fact that we've expanded it to 138 FPL, he's, uh, he's got to pay for that. Now, he has, in his own way, uh, led the charge to uh, bring that expanded population back down to 100 percent of federal poverty level. But at the end of the day, this is all, th this whole house of cards is built on the ability and the desire of the federal government to pay its share. And I said, uh, when asked by legislators debating the expansion of Medicaid in our state, when I visited the Capitol some years ago, that uh, I'm, I'm not real sure if it's wise, even though it will promise to bring a lot of people into the healthcare system, not presently there, but I'm not sure it's wise to build your case on a promise from the federal government that it's going to be there to pay as much as 90 percent of the bill. This stuff is very expensive, uh, and uh, it's, it's a major expansion of government spending. It has become more or less a middle-class entitlement program, and uh, we all know, I know as an appropriator in the U.S. government, that uh, it's the entitlement programs of this country uh, that are responsible for the huge deficit and debts that we're piling on future generations. You just can't continue making the government uh, the panacea for every single issue out there. And this is an extremely expensive part, health care, uh, of, uh, of our economy. So again, sweet spot. How do you find a sweet spot in the discussion where you're never going to make 100 percent of the people happy, but where, where, where can you find balance and practicality? And, and that's why we think it's, it's better when you let market forces uh, play a role in it. It's better when you encourage more personal accountability and personal responsibility. Um, and we're not, I'm not real big on, nor is or most of the members of my party, on government mandates in making people buy things that they may not like, but we also know how important that mandate w was tied in Obamacare to the fact that it was supposed to be part of what helped control the cost. But, so again, finding that sweet spot I think is going to be very difficult, but the expansion of Medicaid uh, has, uh, uh, is, is I think part and parcel to what the governor was most concerned about. And, um, and Arkansas has done a, a very good job with how it's handled uh, their part of, uh, of the Affordable Care Act changes. Uh, but again, very difficult. And, uh, and I'm hopeful that we will continue to uh, see some progress made toward a solution. Well, on to another issue that's very much related. You, you brought up entitlements and deficit spending and debt. You got a, de you got a very important vote coming up soon. That's debt ceiling. Uh, are we going to play chicken on that again? Well, already we are. Well, I won't, but I mean, will we? Uh, no, you've I, always advocated, you know, this is ridiculous. You've got to, that's been your position. You've got to, you got to raise it. Well, you can't full, default. The full faith and credit of the United States of America is something that I think all Americans should be, uh, should take seriously, should, should be very proud of. Um, and since the time I've been in Congress, we've had one downgrade in our credit worthiness which is crazy to me. Uh, we're still probably the best risk out there on the, on the globe, um, but we're $20 trillion in debt. We have a, a deficit that's in the hundreds of billions of dollars every year, so we have to borrow money to maintain government as we know it today. But here's the inconvenient truth, that we spend about a trillion dollars, a little over a trillion dollars a year in discretionary spending. The federal budget's about four trillion, so we spend about 25 percent of our budget on the things that 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 we typically talk about: defense spending, education spending, uh, medical research, and all law enforcement all. courts. Law everything. enforcement courts, yeah. So that's about 25 percent of our budget. Uh, but but let's just use the round number of 500 billion dollars of deficit. Uh, that's half of the discretionary budget. So in order to balance the books, which most people would advocate for, if you do it only on discretionary spending, that means you cut half your discretionary budget. And you can't do that. I mean, that's, that's going to wipe out a whole lot of things that people are, 
reliant upon, and it's going to kill national security. So this is not the time to do that. So it, it could only, it, it can only mean that you have to look at the other three-fourths of the budget for, for reforms, for long-term sustainability. And that's when you get into things like Medicare and Medicaid and Social Security. And those are the programs where we're putting 10 or 11,000 people a day into those programs and will for the next generation. And we're going to add 30 or 40 million more people to those roles. And people are living longer. So the actuarial tables, the mathematics of these social safety net programs are simply not survivable, not sustainable on the long term. So uh, something has to be done about it. And, and I'm one of these people that believes that, um, that if you vote for a budget, and I do, <clears throat> and if you support these appropriations measures, as I do, then that's where you're making your vote on the debt ceiling because you know you're out of balance. And even if you can't, if you can't balance in a 10-year, like, like the 10-year window of the budget committee, then that means you're automatically going to be adding to the deficit year over year. So if you're, ad if you're voting for these budgets, then you're, that's tantamount to saying, I'm going to support the debt ceiling increase because I know we're going to exceed it. Now what we have to do is find, bend the curve in the out years and start the process of moving this country back toward a physically sustainable position. But again, unless you get into the mandatory side of spending, you're not going to get there. Well, uh, another component is a tax bill, it would seem, or tax policy, and that's that's jammed up as well. Well, it is, and and I think part of the reason is because it's um, there are many different approaches to tax reform. You want to lower the rates, which I support, um, but you also want to make it deficit neutral, which I've got some questions about, because if you're a true believer in tax reform, then you must believe it's going to improve your economic condition and it may not happen overnight. It may be two or three years later. Enhanced revenue. So yeah, it? enhanced revenue, more people working, more people paying taxes, uh, growth in the economy, um, the repatriation of dollars coming back into our economy, building infrastructure and uh, expanding uh, economic base of, of this country. So if you're a true believer in tax reform as I am, you got to believe that in the out years, you're going to benefit may not see it overnight, but you're going to benefit in those out years. And, and that's, that's kind of where I come down on tax reform. But um, uh, so, the, so the question on, on the tax bill is where can you put that corporate rate? What happens on the individual side of the house? Because, you know, a whole lot of people that own businesses are not organized under C-Corps. They're, they're, they're organized under the individual code. So you really can't do one without the other. So how do you get that done? How do you make it fair and simple? And um, and Ways and Means has struggled and struggled with it. And I, I, I think they're going to get there, and I think we're going to make it fair and simple. That probably the corporate rate is not going to be exactly where the president wants it, maybe where we all wanted it to begin with. But there's a limit as to how low it can go without uh, maybe doing some damage, uh, some, some deficit and deficit, uh, debt damage uh, uh, later on. So, uh, but I'll let the Ways and Means guys and the, and the leadership sort that out. Before well, you'll have to live with it. You're on the Budget Committee. With whatever well, uh, I, I will, uh, <laughs> and I'm on the Budget Committee because I'm one of the three appropriators assigned to it automatically. Uh, and I assume that that will continue now for the foreseeable future. Uh, but. These are not um, these are not easy issues to understand, and nor are they easy issues to be able to sort out the solutions uh, that come from so many different agendas and 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 personalities that that make up the Congress of the United States and ideologies. You you noted earlier, sir, that it was not really in terms of well repealing ACA. It wasn't seven months; it was seven years. Uh, but you've got a huge ideological split, it would appear, among your in your conference uh, in the House. Obviously, some profound disagreements among Republican members in the Senate. But you now control the White House and both chambers. And yet, how broken is the GOP? Oh, I... I I try to look at things. You rather famously said, we haven't learned how to govern. Well, that doesn't mean we're broken. Um, I don't think we are 
broken. I think we are conflicted. And, uh, you know, I used to jokingly say, as a former mayor in northwest Arkansas, that the hardest job in public service was the mayor of Bella Vista because of all the different personalities that have moved into that area. And that's changed a little bit now because it's uh, there's younger families living there now that are kind of native to the area. But I believe the hardest job in in public service today has to be the Speaker of the House. On the Republican side, the Speaker has 241 members. He, he needs to cobble 218 together because they're not getting any help on the left. Um, and at any moment in time, he's got to be careful that he doesn't move something too far right, that he loses the moderates or too far left and loses the Freedom Caucus. And uh, so how do you keep 218 jumping frogs all in the wheelbarrow at the same time when you need something for a vote? I think what has been elusive to the speaker is the ability to convince our conference at large that we are stronger when we are united. And if you're going to unite this conference, you have to understand that the right is going to have to move a little bit to its left and the left side of our party. These are all still conservative Republicans. The left part of that party is going to have to move a little bit to the right. And we're going to have to understand that we may not get everything we want, but status quo is unacceptable and we have to move something. That's been the problem I think that the speaker has had is that too many people that dig in their heels on their points of view and on their ideology and say it's my way or the highway. And my way or the highway politics is not going to work in a politicized and polarized environment that we exist in today. And I think that's where we need to have some, uh, we, we need to have kind of an introspection and maybe this August break does this for us some introspection as to what we can do to show the American people that with all levers of government now, we can govern. Got to end it there because we're out of time. Congressman, thanks very much, as always, for coming and making Always great to be us. with you, Steve. Thank you so much. All right. Good luck in the session to come. Mm -hmm. See you next week. Local broadcast of Arkansas Week is made possible in part by the award-winning Arkansas Democrat Gazette, Arkansas's largest major newspaper, bringing you local, national, and international news since 1819. By the Arkansas Times, keeping you informed by covering people, events, and politics in Arkansas. By FM 89, KUAR in Little Rock, with in-depth news reporting, analysis, and discussion each weekday.